And despite that we developed vaccinations and antibiotics in the 20th century, infectious diseases are actually still a big problem today. It was actually said in the 1960s that by the end of the 20th century, we will not have any infectious disease anymore. However, today we know better. And that is mostly because some of those pathogens, like for example tuberculosis, became um, antibiotic resistant, so that's a big problem today. It's actually again killing millions of people like it did maybe hundreds of years ago. And then also we have uh, pathogens that were just recently discovered and became actually major um, pandemics again, such as for example HIV. Um, we of course know also about SARS, Hanta, Ebola and so forth. So new infectious disease, which are now called um, emerging infectious disease that were just um, basically discovered in the last 20 or 30 years. And that is uh, mostly because of globalization, so we're becoming a globalized world. There's a lot of traffic between continents, between also very remote areas of the world, and we receive actually pathogens again from those places. However, we know very little about the evolution of infectious disease. Why is that? That is mostly because we usually don't have fossils that we can use to study evolution. So if we study evolution, for example, I have worked a long time for, like on the Neanderthal Genome Project, when we want to study human evolution, we can look at Neanderthal fossils. Or we can look at any kind of fossils to see how humans have changed over the last few million years. However, with pathogens, we usually do not have fossils. So we can actually not know how fast do pathogens, for example, evolve. We just know that from maybe um, in vitro studies that we can carry out, but we don't really know how fast pathogens have changed over thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. We also know very little what happens in the early stages of zoonotic processes. So when the pathogen, for example, really jumps from the um, animal to the human host, so how does it adapt to the human host? And we also know very little about how humans actually adapt to the pathogen early during those processes. So does the human genome actually change to certain immunity-related genes, for example, rise up in frequency because people are more resistant to this disease? And this is actually where we studied then, uh, where we started to study this topic two years ago um, by coming up with kind of a new research field, and that research field is ancient pathogen genomics. So what we do is we sequence the genomes of ancient pathogens that basically were around hundreds of thousands of years ago that then serve for us as a kind of molecular fossil. So we basically go back in time, we study the genome of the pathogen thousands of years ago, and then we compare it to the modern genomes of the pathogen to see how they have changed, how they have evolved, and how fast they, for example, have changed. And the first example that I want to introduce you today to where we have studied this ancient genome is then from one of the major pandemics in human history, and that was the Black Death. So the Black Death, like I said, is a pandemic which happened in the 14th century. And in just five years, between 1347 and 1351, it killed about 50% of all Europeans. So it was really devastating, killed millions of people. And we believe today that it arose in China. So it evolved somehow in China um, and spread over the Silk Road from Eastern Asia and the Black Sea into Europe. So the first historical records we have are from Messina, from Sicily, and then from harbor cities such as Genoa and Marseille, and then it spread into London and to other cities. In just five years, it spread all over the continent, really killing a lot of people. And today it is believed that this pandemic was caused by a bacterium which is called um, Yersinia pestis. So Yersinia pestis is known since the 19th century, causing a disease called bubonic plague, like most of you have, I'm sure, heard about. What is bubonic plague? Bubonic plague is actually a rodent disease, so it usually occurs in wild rodents, such as squirrels, for example. And it can travel between wild rodents and kind of commensals of humans, so domestic rodents, such as rats and mice. And it usually travels by fleas, so the flea bites the squirrel, which is infected. And when it bites, it actually takes up those bacteria, Yersinia pestis. And those bacteria are quite tricky, they actually produce a protein which clogs the stomach of the flea. So when the flea bites again, it cannot swallow, but actually it spits basically the blood from the previous bite into the new bite. And what then happens is basically this squirrel or the other rodent, for example, gets infected. And that's the same way how those um, rats can then also transmit those bacteria to humans. So the rats have 
fleas, those fleas bite humans, and then humans also get infected. So what happens then is they get somehow bitten by the flea, which has this bacteria, and those bacteria then travel in the body of the infected person. Usually they first go um, making those, those buboes and the lymphatic knots. So the lymphatic knots are actually serving as a first breeding ground for those bacteria. They get really big, and from those um, lymphatic knots here throughout the lymph system, those bacteria travel all over the body, infect all organs, so that usually within seven to 10 days, people die because all the organs basically fail, which is a really horrible death. So it's also that uh, extremities such as fingers and toes usually then die, um, basically all the tissue dies sooner or later if you don't get treated. But that's actually not the only form of um, this disease caused by this bacteria. There's another form which is called pneumonic plague. And that is actually not transmitted by biting, but that is transmitted by droplet infection. So when humans, for example, are infected, they have infected lungs, when they then cough, when they breathe, by droplets, they can actually infect another person. So if that person gets the bacteria into the lung, then the lung gets infected, and that's usually killing you within 24 hours. And that is pretty bad, because usually when people show the first symptoms, which is under after 20 to 22 hours, it's too late to treat them with antibiotics. So still today, when it occurred the last time, for example, in India, which was in the 1990s, most people that got pneumonic plague actually died because antibiotic treatment was basically not possible anymore. So that's really still a very severe form of plague. So like I said, plague is still around today in the world. Even though we have antibiotics, it is a rodent disease. So rodents still have it, and we haven't exterminated all the rodents in the world. So there's plenty of them all over the world, and they still carry this disease. So especially in the United States, as well as in Asia, and in Africa, we have every year many cases of uh, plague, of bubonic plague usually. So people get infected from rodents. So there was a case, for example, just uh, three weeks ago, where a person in Oregon actually got infected and actually died um, of um, bubonic plague in this case because it wasn't treated early enough, so it was basically too late when people found this uh, fellow who was kind of a woodcutter somewhere in a remote area. He didn't know what he has, and when they actually diagnosed it, it was too late. So still people die of it. So Yersinia pestis is a gram-negative bacterium, and what we know about the genetics of um, Yersinia pestis is that it has four components, four genetic components. So it has a large chromosome, which is about 4 million or 4.6 million base pairs, and then we have three different plasmids. One of those plasmids is also shared with other Yersinia bacteria, so some of you might know Yersinia enterolytica, which is a model organism that a lot of people use to study molecular biology, and there's also two um, plasmids here, um, which are not shared with any other Yersinia form, which are unique to Yersinia pestis. So they were acquired at some point during the evolution of those bacteria, and they actually allow the bacteria to enter the human host. So without those two plasmids, they could not enter the human host. So that's really important for those bacteria. And then one of those plasmids, the PCP, is actually a very high copy number, which is important later on in the talk. So there are usually about 100 copies per cell. So it's a bit like mitochondria in a human cell. So there are many, many copies, which usually for us makes it easier to study it. So what else do we know about the genetics of Yersinia pestis? We have about 20 genome sequences, so of modern Yersinia pestis forms, which are sequenced today. And if you draw a phylogenetic tree, so you link those genomes to each other, you get a phylogeny that kind of roughly looks like that. You have the so-called branch one and branch two human pathogenic Yersinia pestis strains. So those are the strains, for example, that caused bubonic plague in the 20th century as well in the 19th century um, that were partially um, isolated from rodents, but also partially isolated from people throughout the 20th century. And then you have the branch zero, which has the rodent pathogen. So some of the strains were actually shown to be not infectious to humans. Now, don't ask me about the research. It was done in China. It's really horrible. Um, but what they basically did is they tried to infect prisoners with those strains, and they were not successful, um, which is yeah, a bit unfortunate, I think. Um, I mean, not unfortunate that they didn't get infected, but I mean, <laughs> it's maybe a bit uh, problematic research. Um, and what you can also see when you compare those genomes to each other, they have very little diversity. So there's almost no differences between the different strains. So they're very, very similar to each other. So what people then have also tried is they wanted to date the divergence time of those strains. So they wanted to 
basically find out when did, for example, the human pathogenic strains diverge from each other and when did the human pathogenic strains diverge from the rodent pathogenic strains to basically know a bit about when did this disease occur for the first time. Unfortunately, like I said, it is very difficult to study the evolution because you don't really know how fast those bacterial strains change, how fast do they mutate. Usually when we want to get the molecular clock and we want to calculate how fast do DNA sequences change over time, we use fossil calibration points. However, here we do not have fossil calibration points, so you can only look basically how the bacteria change in this 